Welcome back to WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Happy September and Labor Day and football season, election season. We are merging WNST.net along with Baltimore Positive into one very convenient portal now that we're getting up on about 300 episodes. All of them brought to you by our friends at Taharka, Mint Flicks and Chill. This is the peppermint ice cream with the homemade peppermint patties and chocolate. Uh, it's so good. It's gone. It's missing. It's in my belly. Uh, I've been working it out on the yoga uh, mat here. Uh, I can vouch for that. We use it ourselves. We eat it ourselves. It's terrific. They even got it's it down in Delaware for 10 minutes. Told us. It's true. Uh, to Harka made in Baltimore, you can order it. Our friends at State Fair, where we first visited with Ted right before COVID, uh, and our friends at Fadley's, where you can ship those crab cakes down to the beach, Pronto One Press, Big appreciation for them, as well as Moeller and Gary Realty. And next week when we can uh, bring the sites together, I'm going to bring Jeff on. We're going to talk some football, as well as a red-hot real estate market. You can learn more at Moeller and Gary Realty. Uh, Don, I'm going to give you some oxygen here in this one because Ted Venatoulis has uh, become a recurring character in, uh, in you know, what we've done here at Baltimore Positive and, and really the Towson Times and you know, me campaigning really, really hard against him when I was eight or nine and didn't know any better for <laughs> John Coolahan and the Lion of Hale Corp. Oh um, but but for, for what we've tried to do, you have now involved Ted and Zoom. We've even got Ted Zooming. This is Ted's inaugural <laughs> Zoom here. It's the SS. You can thank my more positive, my you know? wife and daughter. <laughs> and it's a real background, right? It's a real, right. a real right. bookshelf. Right. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome my good buddy and uh, former Baltimore County executive, Ted Venatoulis, to Baltimore Positive. He's a regular contributor here, regular guest with us. And, Ted, when, when you and I spoke off the air, I said what I'd like to do over the next 60 or so days is to have you on periodically for a sort of a, a state of the race. I'd, I'd like you to put your political science hat, your, your journalist hat on and sort of begin to handicap this thing. As I said, we're going to we do our best not to make it an anti Trump, sure. uh, you yeah. know, rant. We, we, we and by do the way, that. we've had the Republican representative on this week. We, you know, yeah, David we, Marks on. Larry Hogan, we've invited. He has a cordial invitation through Kiefer Mitchell. So, uh, you know, we're, I, 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 I do not want to be called partisan around here. That really no, doesn't. No, no, we, 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 we want to have a lot of Republicans on. So right. we, we really want to take a state of this race. You've had an opportunity now over the past few weeks. Both political conventions have come and gone. Uh, it was political conventions in the age of COVID, virtual conventions. Uh, give, us, give us your take, Ted, as an analyst who's been watching this stuff for decades. Well, when I, in fact, when I had my television show years ago, it's exactly how we had to behave in a nonpartisan way or in a bipartisan way. We try to get observations rather than a partisan rant. Which I'm perfectly capable of doing, as you <laughs> which know. is why we invite so you here. <laughs> right. Anybody, so if you want some fun, I want the new Ted. I don't want the old Ted. Follow, follow Ted Venetoulis. Well, we Become can do some of that, but we'll try to separate it. <laughs> Anyhow, a let, let, me, let me uh, put us in perspective now. Now that the conventions are over, um, and let's deal with the conventions first for a moment because they're very <clears throat> symbolic and do kind of summarize what's been going on prior to that. My view on the conventions was this, that they both set out to do, to accomplish some objectives, strategic objectives. The Democrats who had to go first really had a very difficult task in that they were brand new. They were virgin in a new convention, no crowds. The delegates weren't standing up and, you know, doing all that and the applause and the balloons and the hubbub in the audience. I've been to every convention beginning as a student for John Kennedy. And uh, I've been through for public life. I was a delegate for Jerry Brown. My wife was a delegate. I was a spouse. She was a delegate for Hillary. By the way, Ted, and maybe this speaks to something. I I've never attended one, but you've only been at it. You've never watched it on television. You've only been there. Yes. Well, yes. For the last, yes. Since that's John fascinating. Kennedy, I mean, to, to have been there in the 60s or 70s, that's the a, time. It's a right, different exactly way right. 
to, yeah. to be there than see. Because I've been to the last 25 Super Bowls, which means I don't watch it on TV. I don't see it the same way you see it. You know what I mean? I'm like, I Dad, before you jump in, you. before you <laughs> yeah. jump in and respond to Nestor's question about the conventions, uh, your, your finger's covering up a little bit of your oh, microphone. So just okay. there you go. There is you go. Is that better? We're working my, much uh, better. My iPad is sliding. In We're zooming. Yes, sir. Well, we yeah, we want to see you and not your finger. So, Nestor, <laughs> okay. what was your point to Ted about the well, convention? Well, just the fact that you were in the room. You were in the yeah. arena, not watching it on maybe a black and white television back in the day or whatever it is. Because to your point, the Democratic convention two weeks ago, literally a made-for-television studio event as it, opposed it, to a made-for-television right arena event right it broke it broke ground it really did and the democrats um created a pretty amazing convention i thought that, that since they were first out of the box how would they do this and i thought they used some gambits and tricks that really worked it was made for television and their producers whoever they are are did a really inspirational job in creating their strategy and their strategy is mostly optimism, mostly aspirational, mostly hope, uh, mostly to bring out um, Biden's character. But they brought it out, not necessarily with him. They had a lot of different people. Uh, they had, when they did the roll call, I don't know if you noticed, they had 50 different segments right across the country. You got a magnificent view of the country because each roll call person or group had the country in the background and it showed all the variety. I thought it was very, very clever. They also had, ampl they uh, amplified it with videos of people. The one video about the young man who had a stuttering problem, I thought was just classic. And uh, it really sh showed and dealt with Biden's issue, which is stuttering that he had most of his life. And when you're seeing him halting a little bit, it's per part of that emerging. So when they showed Biden helping this young boy get over his stutter stuttering, it really was uh, impactful, I thought. I mean, as a the human being, the Republican yes. Democrat, if you're not in the 99 percentile to think that that, that is really an amazing thing, I, I, you know, I sort of pray for you, right? Like when, when you see that, even if you're a Republican, the hardest, you have the Trump sign out on the Delaware lawn where, yeah, down where does, you live, uh, just seeing the humanity of Joe Biden, that, that's part that, that, that really bothers me over the next 60 days is yeah. to see humanity slice back on someone who's 80 years old and has lived in the public like you for 80 years That's true. and and this is where you are yeah the, the, the right. fact that you know uh, whether you vote for biden or against him and he lost all of those years of you know running around and campaigning trying to become a presidential candidate never really won a state but but to 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 see that the humanity part of him that should speak to a hundred percent of us really well, if we're good uh, Nestor, that was a part of their strategy and i think they carried that out and, and notice again i'll repeat it wasn't all biden and harris they had they had republicans on a, no, a number of them vouching for were showing that they were changing parties it was a people-oriented thing and i thought it really worked out well the um also the moderators three really terrific women who came out and act as, acted as MCs, brought a little humor to it, to particularly the, it was a, a Dreyfus, the one that played in Veep, the lady that played in Veep, she was just very humorous. Most it people know her from nice Seinfeld, time. but that's okay, that's okay. Oh, and from Seinfeld, you're right, I forgot about that, right, right, she really is. So, she, so in any event, that was their composite, and again, you have to look at it logistically. Did they succeed there? There were glitches, but I think they did. And then substantively, I think they got this message, this message of humanity, of, uh, of sensitivity, of compassion, of decency. That's really where what their substance was all about. Never mind the issue pounding. They pounded at Trump on the, on the virus. They pounded him on a number of his uh, falsehoods. They did all that. But I thought the strategy was to show Biden as a very decent, compassionate person, and they succeeded. Now, the Republicans, they had a different strategy, and they tried to carry out that strategy, and I think in many ways they succeeded in doing that, at least their own for what they set out as their strategy. Whether either of these 
determine who's going to win is a different is issue. But, and I but only it, one of them broke the law the whole week while they did it, too. So let's, yo, that is true. Yes. <laughs> and you don't want me to rant, so we don't want to get No, no, you must <laughs> rant. No, 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 no. No, 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 Ted, come on now. The backdrop okay. of this is they okay. broke the law uh, doing it, right? They did. Like, they did. They, they did. did. And then they broke a lot of That's laws. That's not a small thing. No. I'll come to that. Maybe I'll touch on that. But let me describe my analysis of their convention. Their convention typified, and, and by the way, these conventions do typify the person that they end up nominating. In this instance, we knew who the nominees were going to be from the beginning. So the conventions were structured around that. The Trump convention was exactly that. It was a Trump convention. He appeared all the time. At the end of every one of the four days, he was there. He was in all of the videos because that's Trump. That's his nature. He needs and he feels that he is the best thing he's got for his own media. And so he was present paramount. Their objective substantively, by the way, their logistics, I did not think were as good in terms of the transition from a rally, conventions of rallies, to conventions for full media exposure, which is mostly more low key. The woman that they had, um, the, who the Guilfoyle, I think her name was, who shouted at an empty room, didn't come across well. Everyone knew the room was empty. Well, also the fact that it's the girlfriend of his son. Well, that's a different issue, but in terms of a presentation at a convention, uh, I remember how Hubert Humphrey used to always shout. He did not understand how to use the mic. And I would have thought she would have been better at that. Her shouting didn't help. But anyhow, that was just one phase of it. The Republican convention was really truly a Trump convention. And his objective, I think strategically, was to make an alliance with anger. They feel that I think their cause is going to be better served by riling up the public. And they may be that may do that. That's happened before in American politics. You you shoot for the for the fear and the anguish and the anger and the unhappiness of people. And that can be a very motivating factor. Reagan did just the opposite, if you'll remember. He was an optimist, uh, shining city on the hill. He had a whole different view of his own personality and his personality worked better in that way. Trump's may well work this way. Uh, I'm not sure. But substantively, so logistically, I don't think they were as good as, uh, as, as the uh, Democrats were in this, because they could not, Trump loves rallies. Their convention could not have a rally. The last night when he spoke, they had a, a couple thousand people, I think. But there was something about that that may not have worked because they didn't have masks. People are into that now. And there may be a debate over it, but when you're doing something for the broad public, you, you don't want to debate it. You want to do what there's a sensitivity to what should be done for the public. So they took a chance. So strategically, they each carried out what they wanted to carry out. We'll find out in the election who won that. Uh, apparently, neither of them got a bump. But I don't look at it in that context. I think you have to look bumps in the nature of their entire campaign. Strategically, they both carried out what they wanted to do. Trump carried out his image, his strategy, and certainly the Biden people carried out their strategy. You, you know, Ted, it's interesting when you make that point. If, if a few weeks ago, Nestor and I interviewed a university, I mean, a Morgan State University a political science professor, communications professor, Jason Johnson, who's regularly on MSNBC and is a contributor to the GRIO. And as a political scientist, he told us, and I've since heard him make this point on the cable news networks, that he rejects the idea of undecided voters. He said he, he believes that undecided voters are fool's gold, that in our divided society anymore, he doesn't think there are undecided voters. And he thinks every election now comes down to who can communicate effectively with its base to get its base to the polls. And, and I wonder, what's your sense of that? I think he may be right about that, although I must say it's been true mostly for all politics. 
first thing you do, Don, as you know, right. being in it and having to run, you got to mobilize your base. Right. You go after that first and you have to uh, organize your campaign that way. In other words, where do you go to campaign? You have a choice. You can go where you can hope to change some people's mind. A Democrat might want to go into a Republican area uh, to see what he or she can do there. Or you go where your base is, where fellow Democrats are, and try to motivate them to get out. So you can get maybe eight out of 10 to go out. In the Republican area, you might only get five, four out of 10, to, four out of 10 to go out. So it's strategically, this time it was to really the oomph degree. I think they both were playing, although my observation of the uh, Biden strategy was to broaden the base. The strategy of the Trump group is really to mobilize its base. Well, Ted, so I, Ted I, want to, I want you to, I want you, I'm going to jump in because I want Go you ahead. to talk yeah. about that because that to me is the high risk, uh, high reward, low reward strategy that that the Trump campaign appears to have set it on. And about six weeks ago, and actually we, we may you may have been on with us right about this time, but about six weeks ago, there, there was a little article, I think it was in Politico, that did not get a lot of attention. And Trump was screaming and shouting at his inner circle, who was trying to moderate his views particularly on race. And the president said, you all don't get it. We're not closing the gap because I'm not moderating on race enough. We're closing it because, and this was a quote, unnamed sources in that meeting, and I know people don't like them, but this was a pretty good reporter, said, we're losing because I've not been racist enough, and that ends today. And since that moment, his strategy has been pretty overtly to try to flame that race card in a way that you and I remember vividly. Yeah. Nestor was a pup. George Wallace and others. Oh, absolutely. Did. Uh, yes. I've written recently about well, George Well, the Republican Mahoney. National Convention where he's naturalizing citizens who didn't even know they were well. participating in – in this this game show that he's got going on and parading around people of color that I have not seen for four years other than in some cursory way, I found it particularly revolting. As, you know, yeah. uh, as, uh, as my mom would say, I get my Latin up uh, when I hear that. But you, know? you weren't, and Ted, jump in on this. Nestor, I suggest that you weren't their audience and I right. wasn't right. their right. audience. Right. And just... In an yeah. anecdotal way, and Fred and Ted, you have friends all over the place as well. I will tell you that my right-leaning friends and relatives, the Republican <laughs> convention worked for them. That's exactly right, Don. That's why I say they both carried out their strategy. There was one element of it that I'm not sure how it's going to break, and Nestor touched on it. Using the White House using what is essentially sacred ground, using an institution that we seldom, but we have never seen a president use, none of them, because there is a Rose Garden strategy, but that takes place before the election. It takes place usually during the year and maybe the months before an election starts. And never has there been such an aggrandizement of the White House and that institution. And that was just part of it. Uh, apparently, the Trump folks used music they had not been authorized to use. I think Leonard Cohen's, some of his music told him they could not use it. They right. proceeded to use it anyhow. And Nestor, when you said about breaking the law, the Hatch Act, which does not allow public officials to participate, to protect other officials from not being forced to participate. And then, apparently, they had some people that they naturalized on the air and used for video had not given their consent. That's a no-no, as you know, Don, in politics. We never used a citizen without that citizen's consent in any of our commercials or any promotions, whatever, whatever we were doing. So one wonders about that strategic element in terms of what, where they were going. Uh, now maybe it worked because the White House's grandeur, the grounds magnificent, 
Um, to deploy it this way is a, I, I, it's not a precedent we want to maintain, I think, in American politics. So anyhow, that's the, um, that's my view on the conventions. Now, where do we go from here? Um, it's going to be a rough campaign. We've seen rough campaigns. Uh, Nixon Kennedy was rough. John Kerry, the swift voting was rough. Uh, Dukakis, the Willie Horton was rough, ugly. Uh, that's the nature of our politics. I think this time we're going to see something that we have never seen before. And I think it is because the personality of, of uh, Mr. Trump is, um, is geared for that kind of combat. Uh, well, he, well, Ted, where he's, ro where he's rolling the dice for me, and <clears throat> I'm like you, I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether he comes up aces or whether he comes up snake eyes. It's, it's one or the other. And that is he, he is banking on the fact that there are enough particularly suburban voters who become terrified of this violence in our inner cities. And clearly to the point where I would suggest that in recent days, he actually has encouraged his supporters in pickup trucks to ride through towns and shoot paintballs at people because the more chaos there is he's i think saying i've got to get people terrified that this is awful and democrats will make it worse the 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 where i think he's on real and we won't know until november 3rd or a week or so later where that may be a tough sell is what biden did recently when he went to Pittsburgh and just looked into the camera and said, do I look like a radical, a radical. socialist? Really? Yeah. You know, and, and it's funny. I spoke, Nestor, I didn't even tell you this. I, I spoke to some folks. Uh, I, I, I have some relationships with some of the people in uh, the vice president's inner circle. And I love that line. I texted them right away. And that was a line that he inserted and Ted, you love the game of politics. That was not in his original remark. No kidding. That was and, the, line. and the it vice really president is. put them in there himself. So yeah. his risk is that people are going to say the chaos gets better if we reelect Donald Trump. Am I, am I wrong on that, Ted? Is that no, his I, 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 Don, I, I don't think we have to think about that. Uh, they said it. Right. They really have uh, told us, frankly, what their strategy is. His press secretary... Uh, Kellyanne indicated the other day that chaos, intrusion, violence uh, works for us. And it's probably done. It's the old Buchanan, it's the old George Wallace approach to public uh, campaigning. Uh, I think you're also right, it's a big risk. But when you're in a position that he's in with the administration that they've had and all the controversies and all the dissembling and the lies and all the difficulties ripping people away from, children away from their mothers, uh, saying John, John McCain is a coward, um, abusing veterans, um, a whole host of things that Trump has done without any shame. Uh, they've got to figure out how to get around that. And I think the best way that they want to do it is through an alliance with anger, not optimism, not hope. But as you have mentioned, the difficulty is going to be making Joe Biden seem to be an indecent person. A scary a guy. Wild, you know, a scary guy. Right. He just doesn't, it doesn't play that way. Now, if he succeeds, then they're going to win the election. Right. And Biden, I thought, strategy to respond to it, not day to day, but to kind of let it emerge. And then as he did uh, in Pittsburgh, gave a wonderful speech and reminded us, and that's the big issue that Trump has to deal with. Trump is the incumbent. Trump talks as if, listen, let's get those guys out of there that have been so incompetent and inept so I can run the country that they've elected me to run. 
Well, you can't do both. You can't throw the rascals out and be the rascal. Well, you can try. And I think that's what uh, Biden was trying to emphasize. I'm not president. Hillary isn't president. Obama's not president. You can attack us all that you want, but we're not here. It's your government and you've got to do something about it. And Trump has to get around that strategy. And we'll see what, and I think his strategy is the cultural war. And we'll, we'll, we'll see if that works. Yeah. It's, the only, it's the only thing, it appears to be the only, I mean, and it, and it drives Nestor crazy because <laughs> Nestor watches the ineptness of COVID response. Yeah, and that's... quite honestly- Well, it's destroyed anytime, the country. And it's destroyed we're... every, part of the country right. for the time being. Yeah. And well, that's to think the, that's, that, that, that's, that the guy that stood publicly and called it a lie, a fake, a democratic hoax, I still have people on my Facebook page who show up who think it's a hoax. Like I, 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 yeah. I, I and they're clearly voting the other side, the science, the facts, none of that seems to matter, but just the lying, just, just the lying. I mean, as we yeah. sit here and speak today, yeah. it, it, you, you know, the Laura Ingraham thing is, I mean, it depends on what day you talk about it, but it's always untrue and it's always racist and it's always divisive. I mean, they're, they're, I, I thought about this, like the words love and the words together and the, and the words united, united states, right? Like, didn't hear any of that. In the Repo nope. I haven't heard any of that nope. in four years, quite frankly. Strategically, that's not their way. Right. The other thing is, Nestor, it's also deadly today because of the virus. People are not wearing masks because their president has suggested they may not be necessary. This is, this is not just partisan politics. This has to do with people's lives, their level of illness that they might end up getting engaged in with long-term consequences. This is one of the problems that we're going to face going forward. The emergence now of something called herd Heard, uh, immunity. Immunity is just, uh, you, you got to understand that that's, you want to get the, half the population to have it so that they can give it to the other half. So everybody is essentially immune from it over the long run. Of course, there'll be a couple million deaths in the course of that. And no, God knows how many uh, elements of illness that will have long-term effect. So <clears throat> this is what we have to be careful about in this campaign. This is the most unusual factor. It's a campaign in the middle of an epidemic. And one doesn't know where that will go in terms of health and illnesses. And so- But the level of propaganda, it, 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 you know, the true propaganda, you know, not campaigning right. as we know it as Americans, propaganda as we would call it, you know, in Russia, quite frankly, it feels like- yeah. I mean, the, the video of him walking out, the guards and all, I mean, that, that is, um, that's not a- the way we do it in America, tradition. No, well, and, and he has uh, the other element is he. Uh, the uh, uh, Trump does have autocratic tendencies. Yes, and that's not unusual. I remember when Nixon wanted to put his uh, his security people in these great outfits, you know, with hats and spears and all that. Well, you know, you get in there and you get carried away. Problem is, Trump was carried away before he got in there, and now it's just doubling up. Yeah, they all so need anyhow, their. They all need Mrs. Landingham, right, from West Wing to tell, oh Jed, to yes. tell Jed Bartlett to straighten <laughs> yeah. up and fly right, Jed. <laughs> well, you that's, know? that's a problem, Don. We both had, we both had right. administrations that say we wanted people around us who would say, run it to us, just, right. just, just a pile of you know what. Come on, you can't do that. You right. shouldn't do it. It's stupid. Well, that's what you want around you. You want people to tell you sometime that you're wrong. You got to do it something. And if, particularly if you're not doing things that are legal, right. you got to have people that are out. Uh, now, I remember my, my uh, uh, what's the council we call them in, in the county, the uh, solicitor. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, he's telling me I couldn't, I couldn't veto something. <laughs> he said, you know what, I'm going to veto it but, anyhow. And we'll, let county, us, we'll let him go. But I know it wasn't right. Yeah. You didn't it's take one the, of the advice, maps. The one advice of the, of the county maps. attorney. Listen, <laughs> yeah. Ted, it's, you're so right. I, I remember, and that's not just in terms of when we were in office. I remember back, we all need those people who say, what are you doing? And, and my wife's always played that role, as has oh, yours. Terrific. You know, well, I isn't that your role with Caminets and Jim? <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, all the time with, with Jim and Kevin. And then and all the okay. way back, though, all the way back, though, well, Kevin, 
Kevin a lot. Kevin and as Ted knows, Kevin, Kevin and my battles are we love oh, each my, other. They were classic. They, they could they hear us classic. from Towson right. to the Dundalk. <laughs> they were, shall we say, animated. But a, a, a dear friend of mine, and, and Ted, she actually worked on uh, your earliest campaign as well. Uh, Bev Hickman and I started oh, yeah, as yeah. social studies teachers at Catonsville, I mean at Lansdowne, way back in 1972. And by the time I became principal at Catonsville, Bev was there and I eventually made her uh, department head of the social studies department when we had a vacancy. And whenever I was veering off to some crazy lane where the teachers thought, there he goes again. I knew when it was really in a crazy lane, when it was <laughs> Bev knocking <laughs> on the door, and she would say, John, do you they have a minute? <laughs> she said, That's exactly what she uh, said, Nestor. They sent course. me, and I would uh, laugh. I'd say, I knew oh, it. I, that's exactly, <laughs> Nestor, that's a great, exactly <laughs> what she would say. They've sent me in here to save you from yourself. But as Ted says, you can't govern or lead without, and there's no gotta, one that plays that role for this man, I don't think. No, and he, if they do, he gets rid of them. Uh, it's a firing inspector generals and anyone who criticizes him. It's really not not the way the gum you remember kevin's when he was out that time and said something your job is to listen my job uh, is to nestor's talk. heard <laughs> nestor's heard the story so many times and, and listeners of the show but my favorite moment of that ted and you love Tev, kevin like your little brother was when we're walking to the car after he screamed at all these people and is going to lead all the network TV shows. That <laughs> Kevin grinned. He turns to me and he says, I, I guess you would have liked me to handle that a little differently. And I just, I looked at him like, I can't even speak to you. Right now. I no can't words. Speak. I have no so, words. Ted, right. handicap us before we, we get out okay. of here. All right. Uh, handicap the race at this point. I know we're, people are tending to focus on the Rust Belt states. And then there's a lot being written right now about the Democratic path being the new Democratic path through the Southwest to out West. So there's there are these two competing narratives going on. Handicap I, I the think race. how you vote is going to be a bigger story in this and, and how people get their ballots and everybody who wants to vote being able to vote. That, to me, that's the bigger story. Yeah, we haven't even touched on that and the importance of that. Uh, but in terms of handicapping, I do believe that uh, because of the climate and the nature that a lot of the voting is baked in and it probably favors Biden. It's a very uncomfortable time in American life. We've got this pandemic, an economy that is collapsing. A lot of people unemployed, families are scared, concerned, what, what, are their kids going to go to work? Do we have daycare support for them? Um, we can't go to ball games. It's, it's really reached a point where there is that sense of well, it's not optimism. And I think a candidate who speaks to the optimism, who speaks to the greatness of America in terms of its relationship with its fellow Americans and not chastising them uh, or creating a worse environment, but trying to improve the current one is going to have the edge. Whether it's close or a landslide, we won't know. My own sense has been for quite a while that the Democrats could hope for a strong victory where they capture the Senate uh, as well as the White House and hold on to the House. That will give us a different government and we'll find out whether we want that kind of unified government rather than what we have today, which is a kind of a split government with power uh, shifting around. The problem with the way power is today that the current president has no respect for the balance of powers. In this country, we've always had two things that have been important. The balance of powers, we know what the legislature should and can do, what the executive can do, what the courts can do. We've gone beyond that now, and there's a battle about what the legitimacy is of this balance. I've always felt that it's been essential and that it's important that we have a loyal opposition. And I think uh, President Trump is changing that. It's no longer a real Republican Party. It's more Trump Party. And that's a different ideological thing. And it's a mistake for many of the well-known, seasoned, smart Republican elected officials not to have tamed him and calmed him down. And I think that will be, in the end, 
what will happen, the punishment that will occur for not remembering the nature of the democratic process, which is checks and balances, loyal opposition, and more civil discourse rather than anger and cultural confusion and commotion. So my sense is, if I were to look at it now, that the edge that uh, Biden has will probably sustain itself unless there's something, I don't know, major. And there's all kinds of major things that can happen, particularly with the president who's, whose relationship with, uh, I don't know, with truth is uh, somewhat uh, challengeable. That's, I mean, a, nice, that that's a nice way I to call put him it. morally <laughs> bankrupt because I'm just paying attention. That's a nice way well, to put it. I wasn't Ted, supposed to rant. <laughs> Ted, before we let you, let you run again, um, it's a quick strategy question. And, and the Biden team has been almost perfect from, yeah, they from have the nice. time they won in South Carolina up yeah. to now. So far be it for me to give them advice. I, I do have one piece of advice if, if my friends there would call me and say, do you have any thoughts? It's a little risky. I think he's got to do now some more interviews. And that means I think he needs to go on with Chris Wallace. I think he maybe needs to do – the different network anchors. I think he needs to show that I'm not afraid to come right out here because I'm real comfortable in who I am. I'm Joe. I'm Joe from Amtrak. I know what I believe in. I've always believed in the same things. And I'm willing to come on and answer. Uh, but now Dan, I understand I the downside, but what do you think, Ted? I don't think there's a downside to it. I think he ought to do it. And I think that is what they're doing. Um, they're not going to have big rallies. They haven't. Notice their convention. Convention was like a fireside chat when they spoke. I was really impressed with that. Both of them, Biden and Harris, when they spoke, it was lengthy. But it was like a fireside chat. There was no interruptions with the She's so impressive, by the way. She is. Yeah, yeah. To, to, she's, she's a terrific running mate. You, and do you know so, her well, Ted? Yeah. She's just been uh, – she's, she's really terrific. It was a good choice. Um, but anyhow, to come back to you, Don, I think that he's got to do that, and he will. And uh, he ought to go on the uh, Fox channels as well. Correct. And they're doing that, by the way. They're doing it. Uh, they've had private group meetings with various different groupings. He's been, he hasn't just been in his basement. They've been running a very shrewd, shrewd strategy related to the virus. They want to show respect for this evil thing. And they want to show respect for the people that would be coming out to these things. And for the Secret Service, by the way who has to travel with him and have no protection themselves from this. So that's their campaign, and I think he will. I also hope that he does periodic addresses like he did from Pittsburgh, maybe even once a week, where he really comes out and, and lets, reminds people of who he is. We've only got 10 weeks left. Less than 60, it? roughly, by the time we air this, it's about 60 days. You're right. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So there's not a lot of weeks. You know how quick these days go when you're down to this level. They go quick. Before you know it, you blink, and it's election night. And you say, geez, where have I been? I haven't gone here. I haven't gone there. I haven't done that. So well, I asked Nestor, I, I asked Nestor last week, Ted, and we both sort of just stare at each other. The one reason why I think it's a bit of an uphill climb for the president is that he only got 46% of yeah. the of the popular right. vote last time hillary won by three, three million, million. I, yeah. we, we, regardless of whether joe wins the presidency he's probably going to win by about every estimate i've seen is about five million um it's very unusual to be elected president in this country without getting just to about that 50 percent threshold yeah bill exactly clinton right. did it but it was in a year when ross perot got 18 percent of the vote yeah. it was an outlier so it's hard for me to imagine if I start with the 46% and let's assume they, they're still with Trump. Let's assume that they, they, they gag over the tweets, but they say, I still like the judges. I still like his position on Roe v. Wade. I still like the fact that he talks tough. I'm going to stick with him. The, those that weren't in the 46% the first time, Ted, it's hard for me to imagine who that voter is who says, you know, I've looked at everything. I've looked at the past three and a half years. I, I, think, I think Donald Trump's done a really nice job. I didn't vote for Hillary 
but I think I am this time. I'm not sure who that voter is. Yeah, I, I don't know that there are those kind of voters, as evidenced by the conventions, where, to my knowledge, Trump, Trump had no Democrats supporting him. They were all members of real tight members of the relatives or the administration, whereas the Biden campaign had a host of Republicans, decent, moderate Republicans who came out and spoke for him. And I think that's the key. I, uh, I'm inclined to agree that there is a, a, the, there's an edge here for the Democrats and for Biden if they can hold on to it and they don't get too cocky and if they get their vote out. And well, I I'm going to vote like uh, my life depends on it, Ted. That's I what think I'm that's do. a way because, to do it. Because, that's, Nestor, what do we say in Baltimore? Democracy is not a spectator sport. I tried it. Look what happened. That's why we're doing this here. <laughs> hey, Ted, hey, stay Don. safe on the shore. When are you coming back here inviting us over to the pool? Well, you... we're going to stay through September <laughs> and, uh, and then come back. We're not having any visitors. We are isolating, self-isolating. <laughs> <laughs> and you and Lynn haven't killed each other. That's no, we haven't. We've done real it's well. It's the Legos <laughs> that keep them together. It's the Legos. It's the puzzles. <laughs> we it's will have you back and... soon right, as a regular time, as we you know break that. this race down every couple of weeks, Ted. Appreciate and you, good Ted. Luck. Let me tell you guys, you're doing a great service to our community. And uh, Thank keep you. it up and expand. I'm sure you will. Thank, Thank you. you. We were proud, you. proud to have been voted uh, just a week or so ago as, what was it, Nestor? Baltimore's best conversation. Well, that's that's in terrific. Magazine. There you, you deserve go. it. Well, since we got great guests on. I keep telling them <laughs> all that. You know. Appreciate you. Ted's over in I hope Eastern I haven't Church. set you back a few Not times. at all. <laughs> Professor Venetoulis. <laughs> Two Baltimore County executives for the price of one on behalf of former County Executive Ted Venetoulis and the publisher to Towson Times, as well as former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller. I am Nestor Aparicio. Love to our friends at Tahar to get out and get the wake and bake or the key lime pie or the roasted strawberry, even the vanilla beans. Delicious. I'll make that argument. Taharka, uh, serving up social change and made here in Baltimore. Our friends at Fadley's, where you can order those crab cakes and have them shipped anywhere in the world, including the Eastern Shore, as well as coming to Catonsville, where next door, right in the same parking lot, it's going to be State Fair and across the street at El Guapo. I can't wait to get out there and uh, get some of that delicious Mexican food. We get things get normalized a little bit as well. Jeff Moeller from Moeller and Gary Realty will be joining us uh, next week as well as we get started for football season. We are merging WNST.net, AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore, with Baltimore Positive. We're calm, we're local. Stick with us.